there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out the UK. Welcome to my channel. For those who have already subscribed, thank you. Thank you for your support. For those who are passing through, if you like what I talk about, please subscribe, share and like. Um, I tend to talk about all different kinds of information. I tend to get all this information from all different sources and piece it together to make some kind of sense. And um, yeah, so to basically inform you, I guess. Um, some of this stuff you probably know, but if you don't, I hope you find it useful. Today, I wanted to talk about how similar the immigration tactics that Trump is using, that the UK is using as well, in a different kind of way, but very, very similar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read um, what Trump's plans are, well, what, not even what his plans are, what he's actually doing to reduce immigration. And I am going to kind of briefly mention how the UK is paralleling that, but on a much more, um, in a much more gentler or um, shrewd way, I should say. Okay, reducing refugee admissions from the previous ceiling of 110,000 um, even though it's undermining the progress of the humanitarian program, according to news reports, the administration is now pressing to lower the annual refugees admission ceiling to zero by next year, by 2020. A complete ending to the refugee resettling pro resettlement program in the United States. So what are the UK doing about uh, refugees and asylum seekers? Well, I think I said in an earlier video that we've got about 28,000 something applications a year. Um, we are, we're host to 1,000 of the world's population, refugee population. At the moment, we have 40,000 um, refugees. Um, what do you call them? Um, 40,000 failed asylum seekers, which means they haven't got through with their application. Where are they? In detention centres, awaiting deportation. Um, I guess that they're in there indefinitely because of paperwork. I'm sure most of them are not going to come over there with passports and stuff. So it must be difficult to send them back when you don't know where to send them back to and without paperwork. So that's the situation with that. Um, also... The UK is just not picking them up. They're allowing them to die at sea, wherever it's possible. I think France intervened the other day. There was some um, trying to get over. UK um, drew a blind eye and France went in and rescued them. I forget how many there were, but it was a couple of hundred. Um, so, yeah, so that is the UK's way of dealing with it. Trump's way and the UK's way. Um there's also normally a straightforward application process. You would fill up an application form, you'd pay your money, within six months you'd get your result, you'd get your um, your extension or whatever it is. What's happening now? This is in America. Um, straightforward. Normally it was a straightforward process like applying for a green card, permanent residency and citizenship, but now it's almost halted. A new mandated in-person interview for all applicants for employment-based immigration applicants has increased processing time and slowed down applications to a crawl. These slowdowns leave thousands of people seeking to naturalise as, as citizens or becoming lawful residents vulnerable and in a state of limbo. So what's the equivalent? People have been waiting for nearly two years for their applications to be processed, and it's getting worse. They're outsourcing. Um, so in the same sense, um, the, the USA, they're talking about this person-to-person um, -person interview now, which is slowing down the process. So what is the UK doing? They've outsourced Soprasteria for £91 million, pounds, who are doing the biometric, which is a one-to-one -one interview. Uh, the people are paying 300 and something, 343 I think it is, for the interview, which is almost double the home office price for the interview. And they're also, they've also paid £150 million to a Dubai-based um, 
organ at Fern. Um, it's just come out apparently, it's all been done in secret, but this Dubai based firm has all our passport application information, they've outsourced all of the, all those visa applications, I don't know what the bloody hell they're doing in there, if they're outsourcing everything, what the hell are those people doing in there, what are they getting paid for, anyway, this, this Dubai um, based company called VFS, um, is subcontracted by the Home Office to deal with visa applications. And so far they've processed 25 million visa applications. And they've been paid 150 million for the contract. And apparently VF Worldwide Holdings are registered in Mauritius, which is an African tax haven. So they're... Let me not even go there. Let me not even go there. Um, so, another similarity. The new U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, USCIS, policy allows officers to outright deny any visa or green card application that is missing evidence or contains an error without giving applicants a chance to fix it. This could mean people with valid visas who are trying to renew could be placed in deportation proceedings. The UK would do have been doing that for quite a while. You make one error, they throw back the application and you have to repay. After you've paid your 3000 or whatever it is, you have to pay all over again for one error. And apparently the Home Office has made over 800% profit from doing this. What it costs for a dependent relative, 3,250, it only costs the home office 4,423 pounds. How can you justify that? So like I said, very, very similar to the US, only doing it in a different way. They're doing it in a more sneaky way because they're not saying we're not allowing you in or we're not doing this. They're not just not processing it. And if they are processing it, they're charging an arm and a leg. And even though they're charging you an arm and a leg, they're still not processing. And if you make a mistake, they are um, throwing it back at you. So indirectly, you become illegal because the form isn't correct and you're forced to self-deport or you just give up. And that's what they hope people will do. They hope that they will self-deport, they'll get fed up of the process and go where they've never been before. A lot of them, they only persist because they do not have anywhere to go. As much as they might have been born in a, another country, if they've been over here since they were three, four, five, what have they got in common with that country? And we live in a time where people are isolated. People aren't contacting um, people in different countries all over the time. All the time. Sometimes I'm in contact with my brother who's in Jamaica, where my brothers, and sometimes in America. Thank God for WhatsApp. If it wasn't for WhatsApp, I wouldn't be in touch with anybody. But there again, you have Facebook, so you can get in touch with them that way. So yeah, you can maintain contact, but it's not the same as living in a country and from the time you're a child and then being thrown into a totally different country that you've got nothing in common with. Um, what else? Ah, um, and despite the crisis level processing delays causing backlogs for various types of visas, that is because they're putting these people in there who are taking really a long time. It's all deliberate attempt to slow down the process. So people just get peed off. There is now a new guidance that makes it easier for USCIS, which is not an enforcement agency, to funnel people it denies into deportation proceedings by issuing a notice of appeal, a notice to appear. That's in America. So what have we got the equivalent? So if, if they deny an application, it's doing the same thing. If they say they find the slightest little thing wrong with your application and they deny you, it's only because we don't have the figures of all of this. But I bet you if somebody did a survey, you'd find so many people have been deported or so many people have had their applications thrown out for something that could just have been corrected. A minor, minor technicality. 
not even that it's something major, not something fraudulent, I'm not even talking about that, but I'm talking about something minor, maybe transposed the the um, date of birth or something and you know you've put it correct somewhere else but you, you you know sometimes you do these things sometimes you could make a minor minor error but there's no room for error in these forms so that throws these people who have made an error on their application form if they don't complete an application quickly which is probably what they do and find that money they'll be technically illegal because the only time you are legally allowed to stay in this country is while an application is being processed. If the, if the application is not being processed or it's been given a decision, then you are technically illegally in the, illegal in the country and you will be uh, you will face deportation proceedings. So a lot of people, they are going to try to find that extra money and resubmit an application because they don't want to be deported. So it's a real money-making scheme. And it's, you know, it's working based on people's fear and vulnerability, which isn't fair. Um, punishing immigrants with legal status. This is America. Uh, punishing immigrants with legal status and their families starting in October 2019. Um, the Department of Homeland Security will be able to deny green cards to immigrants who use basic public benefits like SNAP, which is food stamps, and Medicaid by deeming them more likely to become a public charge dependent on the government at any point in their lives. So I thought that was already in effect, but apparently it takes effect in October, just a, about just over a month away. Um, but in the UK, the equivalent is they're not allowed to access um, welfare benefits in the first place. They're forced into homelessness. They're forced into poverty. They don't have any access to money. So, um, so it's more or less the same. Only one is proactive and the other one is reactive. So technically, a lot of these applicants, providing they were entitled to benefits before they sent in their applications, they are entitled to it until the application is given a decision. If you weren't entitled to it before, then no, you can't get it. But for those of you who are or who were on it before you submitted that application, you are technically entitled to continue. And I bet those are the ones that they process bloody quickly. I bet it's all kind of done in a very particular way when they're processing these applications because they don't want the ones who were claiming before they put in the application to be on that system too long. So I bet you they process their applications quick enough. Um, that is an, an asylum one. I've already done that one. Oh, banning people from Muslim countries. This is America, the third version of Trump's nakedly discriminatory Muslim ban has been okayed by the Supreme Court, barring entry for almost everybody from several Muslim majority countries, including Yemen, Iran, Libya, Chad, Somalia and Syria and to be honest it's not even just those it's lots of countries from you mentioned the word Muslim but I don't know how they know that these people are Muslim I mean unless they overtly look you know like they've got the beard and the long outfit and all that kind of stuff and the garb on you know I don't know how they know that they're Muslim but there again if these people it's only because they're such strict, they're so strict with their faith. They would just put on a shirt and tie and nobody would know because it has to be. But there again, they're going based on the countries. And I believe, you know, that encoding I was talking about in an earlier video, that encoding predominantly Muslim countries will um, be flagged on those passports. So, um, yeah, there's nothing really they can do about that but biometrics and algorithms will determine and will flag that they are from Muslim countries. So they, you know, they're not going to get in, which is total discrimination. But what can you do? Nothing really you can do. 
um, using immigration courts to increase deportation. The Trump administration is reopening thousands of deportation cases that were previously closed due to their low priority, affecting hundreds of thousands of people with close ties to their communities. So apparently we've had thousands of people who were due for deportation. It was stopped because it wasn't considered high priority. Now they're getting on the bandwagon and they're gonna now start deporting all of them. But they don't wanna do it through the proper judges and courts. They want to do it through the immigration courts because it's much more easier to process. It's like they're going through the back door. If you haven't got money to get a lawyer, you're screwed. To speed up deportation, the Justice Department has established a case quota requirement for immigration judges. So I guess they're going to have to get through um, so many a day. I remember reading something about that. They can do, um, I forget how many it was, but it was almost like one a minute or something. It was some ridiculous amount. They just go through deport, 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 you know. There's nothing that the individual can say. It's just like a, a conveyor belt. Um, but, you know, I, I get so much information. And then once I've talked about it, it's gone. I don't retain it in my brain anymore. Otherwise, my brain would be overflowing. Okay, to speed. Okay, I've done that. Um, new plans have been finalised to bypass immigration courts altogether. The Trump administration will expand its use of expedited removal to rapidly deport undocumented immigrants who cannot prove they have continuously lived in the US for two years or more, essentially denying their rights to due process. Had that here been deemed unlawful detainees? Yeah, they had something like that in the UK where they weren't giving people they detained enough time to get a lawyer and access a due process. And they actually stopped it because people were just being um, detained, shipped through the back door onto, onto one of those deportation flights and they were gone. And it's not supposed to happen like that. These people are supposed to get a day, a time, a flight and all of that kind of stuff. So now I think it's, I uh, forget how much days, I think it's about 14 days they're supposed to get notice. And then within that time, they can go at any time. But yeah, so they did try to do that over here, but um, they were doing it through the back door. You see with the US, they do everything out in the open. You know where you stand, you know what to expect. But with the UK, I don't know why they're not as transparent. I don't, I don't know why they're not as transparent. I think it's because they love to be polite. You know, at work, it's really amazing because you go to work and you know somebody's irritating somebody and they say, I'm ever so sorry to bother you. And they're like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. I was just doing um, this thing, but it's okay. I don't mind being interrupted. What is it that you're going to say? It's fine. And it's not fine. It's almost like they don't want to rock the boat for some reason. But I find that a lot. And I was listening out last week. I don't know, I go through these little phases at work. And I was listening to how many people were saying it was fine when it was obviously not fine. It's almost like it's a habit. And the person was being inconvenienced. And they'd still say, oh, it's fine. And they'd say all this other stuff. But it's OK, it's, it's fine. And I think that is what, there's something about the British culture that doesn't I don't know how to I don't know how to phrase it or even explain it but it's that kind of concept that you can't say up front what you really mean you know you don't want to rock you don't want to fluffle any feathers but you do that anyway by being underhanded so you might as well just come out with it okay Trump is getting a hard, you know, is getting a hard hand from everyone because he's coming out and telling people, but he's being transparent. People know what to expect. People are making plans, not unless over here they don't want people to make plans. And as usual, they're doing things undercover and trying to sneak and get them. <laughs> oh, I don't know. The U.S. Citizen and Immigration Service, USCIS, removed language celebrating the United States as a nation of immigrants from its mission statement. Why the hell would you have a nation of immigrants on your mission statement? Anyway, I, I'm sure they just like all this hype. It's just so... Uh, 
Going after naturalised citizens, a new denaturalisation task force has begun, working to strip citizenships from naturalised American citizens. So I mentioned this a long time ago, peeps. You can be naturalized. You can have your you can have your American citizenship and your American passport. The same with like the UK, and they can strip you of it. It's difficult, but they can do it. And they'll find, believe me, Trump will find a way to do it because, as far as he was concerned, and as far as people you know that think like him are concerned, um, America is for the white people. Not for all these other people that are coming in. Sorry, I just had a walnut. Anyway, while these are few, why there are few legal grounds for denaturalization, the administration has already referred a hundred cases to the Justice Department for prosecution. So they've already got a hundred people who are going to be denaturalized. I've got a funny feeling they have to have some kind of criminal record. But I don't know if people think that if they've got, a, if I don't know if people know that if they've got a criminal record, they can be denaturalised. So maybe these hundred cases, which isn't that many, are people who have um, criminal convictions and stuff, and stuff like that. There's also like something else, I forget what it was called, you know me and my memory. Anyway, the creation of the task force is causing a sense of insecurity and uncertainty among naturalised citizens and permanent residents. What are other pending and proposed changes to the immigration system, making people more deportable? Trump has worked to strip legal status for more than one million people by, by terminating deferred action for childhood arrivals, arrivals which is called DACA. Um, those are the children who came under the auspices of illegal parents. The parents are not allowed in the country. They bring over their kids who are also illegal. and um, But because it's not their fault, because they were children, um, Obama had something to protect them. But that's now being overturned, apparently. It's a, the equivalent, I would say, is the Windrush or even EEU, EEA and EU nationals um, coming up now after Brexit, they will fall into a similar category. Not the same, but similar in the sense that those people who have been in the country who may not be legal when they came in and have brought innocent children into the country, these people are going to, the poor children are going to suffer and so are the parents. So they're going to be stripping legal status um, from all of those children because whereas those children had legal status, um, subsequently that's going to be stripped so they'll be left without legal status. And then they'll be vulnerable to deportation. Um, and by ending temporary protected status, TPS, and deferred enforced departure, for most countries, Trump is ending legal status for hundreds of thousands of people and creating a new population of unauthorized immigrants subject to the threat of deportation. So there's going to be thousands of people who are going to fall into this category. Thousands, hundreds of thousands. But sometimes, you know, you can't worry about these things because sometimes these things, it's like when he was talking about those raids, sometimes they're just there to put the fear of God into you and you're going to sink chuck. You know, might as well make a buck. You know what I mean? You reach that point where you can't fight it anymore and you just think. And, you know, I think Trump is hoping that people volunteer and self-deport because it's cheaper. They don't want to pay uh, anybody to go back. So if they, you know, if they put the fear of God in you and you decide to go back, that's saving them money. So I think a lot of times when they're talking about all of this, yes, it will probably happen. It will happen. Um, but at the same token, you know, you have to be rational and know what you're doing and just prepare as long as you're preparing for it, you don't have to do anything now, but prepare for the worst case scenario.
That's all I'm saying. Um, he's creating obstacles for workers and their families. The administration is increasingly denying and delaying more foreign skilled worker requests. Increased issue, issuing of requests for evidence to challenge the basis of original petitions can add on several months to the application process for individuals. The administration has signalled that it intends to end work authorization for spouses on H-1B visa holders. This will likely deter people from coming to the United States to work legally and will have a negative impact on the industries that use the H-1B visa programme. He's also limiting avenues to access immigration services. The Trump administration is closing all 21 overseas USCIS field offices from 20 countries before the end of the year. And um, I heard the UK has already done that. You know, you used to be able to go to one of your consulates. There, none of them, there's none that exists now. I think they've got two somewhere one in the uk and one somewhere else but yeah if they haven't done it already they're also in the process of doing the same thing forcing people you know not to use an avenue you know a second avenue to come in um a second party avenue to come in i should say and um, this which this which greatly impacts refugee applications asylum seekers and other immigration related matters such as international adoptions and family reunifications. Increasing the cost of immigration, I've already said that. The president has a 2020 budget proposal. It includes an immigration service surcharge. I bet that's probably equivalent to our health, um, immigration health surcharge, only they don't offer health. So I don't know what that surcharge is going to, meant to cover, immigration services surcharge, honestly if they're not charging enough already. An estimated 10% fee increase to immigration form filling fees. So that's going to go up by 10%. You're going to start feeling the pinch. And especially if there's more than one of you in the family. It's another addition to the series of financial burdens designed to make it hard for low income people to qualify for legal immigration status. But like they said, they only want the people who are going to add value to the country, people who are wealthy. You know, they don't want people at the other end of the scale who are going to be using benefits and who, you know, at the, you know, the bottom of the barrel. So they're trying to boot them out. And if they can't boot them out one way, they'll force them out another. Um, what changes has the Trump administration pushed for in Congress? Curtailing fam family immigration, <coughs> eliminating many categories of family immigration. So the Zambrano principle that in, at one point you could use as a precedent, that's been closed down. Ah, so that's the most of that. And the main way they're going to stop them once again is through the biometrics. Um, for MasterCard wanting to use the heartbeat data to verify purchases to Google's Abacus project, planning to monitor the usage patterns like voice patterns, typing patterns, etc., to confirm that that this is a specific individual and not a fake person using the device, it is sure that the appetite for biometric is expanding rapidly. So, you know, in a combination with all of these human intervention um, techniques or strategies, we've got it compounded or we've got it supplemented by biometrics. India's national ID program called ADAR, A A. DHAR is the biggest example of biometric security. It has the largest biometric database in the world. I wouldn't have thought that. Wow, India's on top of it, man. Biometrics are extremely hard to fake. A biometric property such as a fingerprint or an eye scan is unique by definition for each individual. Biometrics are stable and enduring, which means it changes very little over the course of one's life and can identify a person in spite of a little variation over time. Average identification time for an identity is five seconds. 
One of the major challenges is the process by which the biometric is captured and mapped to an identity. Lack of accuracy in capturing and partial capture of data and binding can lead to failure of the system. That's that biometric thing I was telling you about. That's picking out all the blacks and the females and the elderly. If the server storing biometric information is hacked, it could have extremely serious consequences for individuals. An example of the breach is the US Office of Personnel Management, OPM, which was hacked, resulting in the theft of 5.6 million fingerprints. The biometrics were stolen along with a lot of data of each person. I wonder what happened with that. I wonder what the outcome was. Um, error in biometric devices, i.e. false reject and false accept. This is usually due to the particular biometric technology being able to read the characteristics of a per given person and for various reasons. The false accept is a scenario in which the device accepts an unauthorised person and the false reject is a scenario in which the device falsely rejects an authorised person. They were talking about somebody who used somebody else's password sports and got through the airport so that would have been a false accept and when they stop people you know whether it's people of color or um, gender or race or age or whatever that would be a falsely reject because it is the person but based on the algorithms and the faulty way it's manufactured um, it would reject them it would reject an authorized person Another major drawback is the high cost which is involved in getting the system up and running and also storing and maintaining the biometrics. I mean, can you imagine where all that information is going to go? It's going to go up in a cloud, but bloody hell. <sighs> anyway, this is how they're going to be able to stop you one way or another. If they don't get you inside with all of these rules and regulations and legislations and protocol, they'll get you coming to the airport with the biometrics. So, not a happy world, is it, at the moment? But being informed is half the battle. So I hope that's what I'm doing for you. Take care for now. Bye-bye.